Hey folks, DJ Singley here with another edition of Next Gen IT. I'm DJ with Mapsis, and today we have a what I consider a special episode. I am going to be recounting my session at the AI Rising conference here in Columbus, Ohio on May 14th. So you're going to get an inside look at what I'm going to be talking about. And what am I going to be talking about? That's right, AI 101. The evolution of the large language model, the deep learning and machine learning frameworks that power today's AI world. So let's take a look, shall we? Thanks for joining us. Hey, did that work? I think it did. Oh, fantastic. That never works, but I'm glad it did this time. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. So we're talking today about AI 101, understanding the language of deep learning and machine learning. All about AI. I am Danian Singley. You can call me DJ, and at some point in the future, I'll tell you all about how I got my crazy first name. I work for Mapsys. Mapsys is a technology company that specializes in hardware, software, sales, maintenance sales, staffing both full-time and part-time, and of course, uh, software design and engineering. So we have been around for 40 years. We, we know our stuff in and out of the data center, and we do a lot of work with AI. I myself have done a lot of work in AI over the last eight years or so. It started out with me selling what was then the fastest supercomputer in the world, IBM's Summit and Sierra systems. And that was a really a fun time for sure. But AI has really progressed since that time and in order to really fully understand it and have a great appreciation of it, we really need to spend a little bit of time taking you through a one-on-one course of sorts to understand it. So this is AI 101, Understanding the Language of Deep Learning and AI. This particular uh, session has been designed by Andrew Laidlaw and Chris Eaton with some additions from myself. Yours truly, here to help you out and understand uh the language of ai so let's let's get into it all right before we do though however i want to draw your attention to our local ai meetup groups here in columbus ohio and truly for all of ohio so myself and tony martin took it upon ourselves along with ibm to start the largest ai meetup groups on, on meetup.com for Ohio. Those meetup groups are Cincinnati, Columbus, and of course, Cleveland. Now, unfortunately, IBM is gonna be sunsetting the two, the two meetup groups uh, that are not in Columbus, <laughs> unfortunately. So we're gonna be migrating most of our users to the Columbus group here. So a lot of what we do in meetup is virtual, and uh, we, we love the virtual. It allows us to reach a lot of folks. And we will eventually do some on-premise meetups. But please, join us for our meetup groups. I think it's a, it's a good experience. It's a good time. And I think you'll all learn quite a bit, for sure. Um, that's really, the, I think, the foundation of this entire talk is that AI is really a journey. It's not a one and done. Okay, I, I saw DJ's uh, talk and I'm all learned up with AI and it'll never change, it'll be fine. No, AI is one of the fastest progressing fields in the history of computer science and computer engineering. And what I tell you today will probably be different in six months. In fact, most of the programmatic ways that we design and play with AI will be different in six months. And it, you really must approach this as a journey. You're gonna get value out of this course today. You're gonna to see value out of continuing your learning tomorrow as we all experience what AI can do to transition and transform our lives, truly. Our session objectives today. I aim and I submit to you that I will help you understand the vocabulary of deep learning and AI. I will ensure that you know the terms in the industry 
and that you are dangerous when you're talking to your very favorite data scientist of whom you will, I'm sure, meet and have a great relationship with. This is not an in-depth technical study. We will not be going down into the super weeds with this stuff. This is more of a primer on the technology, uh, and we will not teach you any programming languages. So if you think you're gonna learn some Python code here to use some large language models with a big giant GPU from NVIDIA or AMD, you are not gonna get that here. Uh, that's the next class, right? I can point you to all those folks who will gladly teach you that. We're going to be spending our time here learning what machine learning and deep learning are and how they're constructed. And to begin that, I'm gonna show this slide here. Now, I actually put a picture over there um, with uh, or, or from Levity, and I think this does a great job of explaining at least what we're gonna be learning about. So the whole field of artificial intelligence has been around for an awfully long time, since the 1950s. And in that period of time, we were using pro programmatic ways of of uh, displaying artificial intelligence. So that means the C language or C++ language. Oh, oh, okay, you got me there. C++ wasn't around 1950, but if and or else statements to create some kind of intelligence in a programmatic way in a program. And so it's been around for an awful long time. Machine learning is, is the next iteration on artificial intelligence and truly it is a a um, a subtopic of the whole artificial intelligence branch right and it gives the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed so any of the art any of the um, um, programmatic or non programmatic ways and uh, to do this is what is covered under the machine learning heading now, deep learning is, is a subset of machine learning in the sense that we are going to give the, um, the computer a, a, a way of understanding uh, via an artificial intelligence in uh, a certain way that like the brain works, right? So while machine learning is just general, uh, you're teaching the computer how to do something with various models that can, that can do it, deep learning really gets at, we're going to really make a model of how a human brain or a mammal brain, we're all mammals, uh, works and we're going to experience the artificial intelligence that way. So those are the three sort of hierarchies of artificial intelligence and let's get right into it. So what is machine learning and deep learning used for? Uh, it is, at its simplest form, machine learning and deep learning is used for identifying patterns in data. That's really all we're trying to do. You know, patterns is what we're looking for. It, it really provides us a tool set or tools to predict new values based on the data that we teach the model. And everything that we're going to learn here is all based on this concept of a model. So <clears throat> what is a model? A model is simply a construct, a computer construct or a logical construct that describes the world of which it has been taught. Do you understand that? I, I think that's pretty clear. I hope it is. Um, machine learning and deep learning involves a lot of statistics and lots of calculations to identify complex patterns. That's really what it's about. Amazing amounts of data go into teaching a model how to view the world and all that data results in an enormous amount of complex calculations and it all is based on statistics so again ultimately at the very end of this entire thing what we want to get out of this is a is to build a complex model of our data to explore and generate new data and new outputs that's what machine learning is that's what deep learning is with machine learning and deep learning they have to be they have to use data types or they have to operate on data types and as, as such there are a few data types that we need to be aware of the first data type is the structured data the structured data is the thing that the entire world is based on it is all every spreadsheet you've ever made it is every relational database you've ever used think oracle sql server db2 
It's everything that has strongly typed structure in the the data rankings or in the, the well, I guess the database, right? So for instance, a spreadsheet, right? Where you might have a person's name, which is a character, a string, numbers, which may represent their bank balance or, or number of widgets they bought, uh, other numbers, which may represent a SKU uh, uh, or a product that they may have purchased. Um, these numbers may all be represented as ints, floats, whatever they may be, but they are strongly typed. Additionally, cells within a database may uh, branch off or point to entirely new tables. So this is all an example of structured data. The world is built out of structured table data. Everyone you've ever talked to has used structured data to great effect. But structured data is not the only data that we want to feed an AI system. Unstructured data, of course you knew this was coming, <laughs> is the next type of data that we want to take a look at. An example of unstructured data is, say, um, an audio file on Facebook or a tweet on Twitter or a video on YouTube. These are all examples of unstructured data, something that is not strongly typed. Um, it's very hard for a computer to understand what a video is of. It's under, you know, here you see some examples of, say, the Statue of Liberty and the city skyline behind it or an audio file, it has no idea what to do with any of this. You, it's very hard programmatically for a human to sit there and, and tell the computer what this is supposed to be and what it's supposed to do. And this is where deep learning and machine learning come in. It's a much easier task for machine learning to decipher what this could possibly be than, than if you were to use a programmatic method. The third data type is, uh, you guessed it, semi-structured data. So semi-structured is sort of exactly what it sounds like. It's a JSON file or an XML file that is not strongly typed. Each uh, individual uh, data element could have many different types or characters or blobs or strings attached to them. They have varying length. They could be very short or very long. It just depends. They could be metadata about unstructured data. So think of a picture file that has a geotag in it, maybe a name, maybe a date, um, you know, other extraneous information. This is all examples of, examples of semi-structured data. And the semi-structured data is really important because we want to give all three types of data to our AI models to derive value from those models. When we're building our models, there are certain training types, and we're going to review those now. The first training type I want to bring your attention to is something called supervised learning. It's when we give the model a set of labeled data. We give that to the system. This is considered the ground truth of the system. So here you can see uh, a bunch of candy bars. This is from my colleagues in England, and they have various candy bars over there that are super gross, but we're going to just <laughs> humor them with this stuff today. Uh, this is a dairy milk bar. Mm, yummy. Sounds really great. I'm a vegan, so, you know, dairy milk. Yay. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fair weather vegan, by the way. <laughs> so but maybe not today so much vegan. But uh, this, so this candy bar, all these various angles of this picture are considered the ground truth of what a dairy milk bar and then you will going to the AI model will compute a confidence score of how confident it is that that particular image or input is a specific output meaning it's a dairy bar a, a dairy milk bar so that is supervised learning when you tell the model what it's seeing is something supervised learning there's also unsupervised learning which is when you provide the model a great deal of unlabeled data to the system. You really don't have a clear understanding of what you're looking for. You're just interested in looking for patterns and what the patterns of the data could tell you, what the correlations, potentially causations within the data will tell you about what's going on with the data. This is unsupervised learning. This is a very important piece of most of the models that we're using today is unsupervised learning when we provide it with um, you know unlabeled data and then finally 
uh, as reinforcement learning. And this is a really good learning um, uh, paradigm for things like game theory. So think of, think of the game of Pong, really. So when you're playing Pong, if you're playing against an AI model, you want to tell the AI model that the only thing that matters is that you get a good score. That's reinforcement learning. You're being reinforced. Every time that ball bounces off that paddle and it scores a point, your point goes up. That's a good thing. When it doesn't bounce up on that paddle and it gets slips past that paddle and you lose a point, that's a bad thing. So that's what reinforcement learning is. Here are some, some examples of the candy bar. Here are some bad examples of the candy bar. You add the good examples with bad examples and hopefully you'll get a positive number. Unfortunately, this example, the poor model, it didn't do so well, so it got a zero. <laughs> so it didn't know what was going on. But reinforcement learning um, is, is a big deal. It, it provide, it's a learning methodology that you're looking for feedback in the system and that to offer rewards, oh, excuse me, um, for, for gaining uh, or for uh, creating the correct answer or for guessing the correct answer. I shouldn't say guessing. It's not a very guess. It's something called an inference, but we'll get to that term a little bit from now. When you build a model, we need to take some time to go over what data splitting is. Let's take a look. Data splitting is simply the idea of taking your entire data set that you're going to use to train your model and splitting it into three, potentially two, uh, sets. The first set you're going to use to train your model. The vast majority of all the data you're going to train your model with. The validation part, or the set, you, the set of data that you set aside for the validation, um, actually a lot of times can be confused with the testing as well. In fact, there's not a real great standard here in data science. Validation and testing, testing and validation, sometimes they can be the same thing. But generally, the validation of the, the validation data is used to test the performance of the model, how fast it is, um, how, how well it's making uh, predictions, and it also can be used to make refinements to the model, meaning that the model actually gets trained on the validation data. It's like the last part of the training. And then lastly, there's the testing part of the, of the paradigm here where you're going to give the data or the model data that it's never seen before and will never see ever. You're just using it to test the model to predict or to show accuracy and and other things, other characteristics of the model. But accuracy is typically the big the big one that everyone is interested in. When you look at data and you're that you're feeding a model, you there is this concept of dimensionality or complexity of, of data, right? And I'll give you some examples of what that might look like because this is important. The first thing is is that um, this is some very easy, easy data to understand as a human. I'm showing you a graph here on the left of a 2D data set. And you can all see, oh, two dimensions. This is very easy. I'm a human. I can understand that. That's sort of a curve that goes up like this. Or a 3D data set. Aha, more complex. However, I can see with my eyes what's going on in that 3d data space with the model and the data and what it's doing all right well what about a four-dimensional model here's an example of a four-dimensional model we have length width and height what's the fourth dimension do you know that's right it's color the fourth dimension in this example is color so that's a very easy way to experience what a four-dimensional model might might visualize for you however as humans past four dimensions it gets pretty tough to see patterns and correlations in data but not for computers what would you do with a nine-dimensional model yes this is your average spreadsheet that has all sorts of numbers and names and all sorts of things in there how are you going to find patterns as a human with a nine dimensional model. And by the way, nine dimensions is nothing for a computer, but boy, 9,000 dimensions or 900,000 dimensions, um, that's still nothing for a computer. But you'll never, ever understand that. And that's why machine learning and, and deep learning exist to really help us find patterns in this data. And really, the large language models and the AI vision models that you've all come to love what it's doing is doing this. This is the basic stuff that it's doing. This is a very academic view of how this all works. It's looking for patterns in this data. 
let's take a look briefly at um, at some of the mathematics involved here. Whoops! Oh no, I just I just <laughs> I just gave you some of the answers next. But let's let's go back. Pretend you didn't see that. Okay, so. Scalar, uh, the first data type we have is a scalar. It is simply a magnitude of data. It tells us very little about the data. It's a number, right? 17, 17.2, 22.5, negative 82 and a half, whatever it happens to be, it's a magnitude. Building upon the scalar, we then have the, uh, why is my mouse not working? It's working now. We have the vector. A vector tells us a little bit more about the data and the data set. It tells us the magnitude, but also a direction within the data and what happens with the magnitude as you travel along a certain direction. So from 12 to 24, you see it gets bigger. From 24 to 36, you see it gets bigger again. But 36 to 42, it gets bigger in a smaller amount. So interesting, right? It gives us more data about what's going on with the data set. But a vector isn't where we're going to stop. A vector is just the beginning of our data journey. What is a, a, a collection of vectors? Well, we call that a matrix. A matrix is the fundamental compute unit of all GPUs in existence, right? All those graphics processing units that are out there, the Playstations, the Xboxes, the Nintendos, the Ataris, okay, maybe not the Ataris, those are kind of, <laughs> kind of before we did a lot of 3D graphics, but all that 3D graphics stuff operates on this matrix idea, which is a collection of vectors. But data science doesn't just stop at matrix. Matrix is a fundamental um, data type of data science, and all these matrix, everything in a matrix represents various things within the model to be computed. But we go one step farther with data science and we use a collection of matrices, which we then called a tensor. And yes, the plural of matrix is matrices. I guess I didn't say that right before, but uh, a collection of matrices is called the tensor. So that is uh, our ultimate data type that we use in data science. So um, when you look at a matrix, you can see that you can travel multiple different dimensions throughout the data. You can, you can choose a horizontal or vertical or maybe even diagonal. And within a tensor, you have even more options as a 3D uh, view of the data you can actually travel through. So you're getting a magnitude and a one heck of a direction when you look at a tensor to go through the data. So that is some mathematics and some of the data types that we use in machine learning. So let's talk a little bit about this machine learning thing. But we're, again, we're gonna take a look at this through a purely academic sense. And I'm going to use some very simplistic models here, very simplistic models, uh, to help you understand what this thing is that we call AI, machine learning. First, we're gonna take a look at a bunch of data. On the left, you can see the data <coughs> that we have here looks very, very good as it looks sort of like a line, right? Uh, so we would, we would maybe use a model of a linear regression to best fit this data. But a linear regression can't possibly fit all data out there. And that's what the right-hand model is for. You can kind of see that it's more like a logarithmic uh, regression or polynomial regression as it kind of goes up to the to the right well if you try to use a model for the left hand data set you see that it fits quite well however a linear regression does not fit the right hand data set very very well at all and again these models are stand in in a purely academic sense for our AI models that do much, much more, right? They are large language models and AI vision models and all this other craziness, right? But this is still a basic model. So again, left is good, right is bad. So as a data scientist, our whole job is to appropriately fit the model so we are not overfitting the model or underfitting the model. So as you can see on the left, this is an example of an overfitment of a model where we practically can regenerate every single data point that the model has ever seen because the model is so complex that we, it, is, it is known as an overfitment. Now, why is this bad? 
It is bad specifically because it takes too much compute resources to create the model and certainly too many root compute resources to inference on the model or to run the model. So it's just not a great model. It's not economical. The model on the right though, on the other hand, is a very poor model if you're trying to use a linear regression on it. And that is an example of an underfitment. It clearly, this linear regression does not match the data on the model whatsoever in any way. So that's the job of a data scientist is to really understand um, what the what the model should be doing and how much computation work and which really relates to cost the model can sustain for the business objective or whatever objective you happen to have again here's a, a machine learning task in our, our very first data set that i showed you before what's a better model for this you got a polynomial rejection regression or a logistic regression much better fit than 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 any other type of model that we could use for it so um, more complex models may offer better fit but again they require much more computation so that's what we're trying to avoid we're trying to find the right model with the right uh, error rate that will be acceptable for our application i'd be remiss if i didn't at least throw this up there this is a, a different type of model, and I wanted to show it to you. Um, maybe it's a purely academic and it's too geeky, who cares? But this is an example of k-means clustering, right? Where you're looking just for a cluster about where the data lies. So here are the clusters that the model is able to identify, and new data points are put up in, the, in this particular model. And at, that, at this point, you can see where they may, they may lie in, within the clusters of data objects. So this is a type of unsuper sub, uh, excuse me. This is a type of unsupervised learning in which we will segregate data from the rest of the data. So that was a good example, I think, or a very simplistic example, maybe not good, but I think it's a pretty simplistic example of what machine learning is. Deep learning is the ultimate AI algorithm and and truly model that we can look at. So let's learn a little bit about what deep learning looks like. Deep learning strives to create a model that is very similar to the network that is in our own brains. That's right, the human brain. We want to loosely mimic the neurons and the axons and the dendrites and all that that we see in the human brain to create a model that will learn and provide business value as an output. A lot of processing goes into the processing of these patterns and a lot of calculations for sure. Generally, this is what a deep learning model will look like. You have some outputs, or some, I'm sorry, some inputs, then there's some layers, hidden layers that we call them, and then some output at the end. And this could be lots of different things. In your large language sense, you're putting in some text in and you want some text out, all right? It's the job of the data scientists to figure out when they're building the model, how many hidden layers you really want in this model. Because it, it matters. The more hidden layers, the more complex the model, the more expensive it is to run, which is something called inferencing, which is to get the answer out of the model. And of course, much more expensive to actually train the model. However, if you don't have enough hidden layers, the model may not have the required resolution to give you useful answers out of it. So with models, right? We, with these neural networks, there are two kinds of neural networks that we typically use today. Convolutional neural networks, which are much simpler, which performs the same processing, over multiple subsets of data. So this is great for vision tasks, whatever they may be, whether it's a picture or a video, it's perfect. Over current neural networks, which all the LLMs that we know and love are based on. And this is really where prompt engineering comes in. And if you don't know what that is, I'll cover that in just a little bit. A recurrent neural network is a, um, is a neural network that passes some of the output layers back into the input on the same layer. 
So it's a, it's a way for the model to retain some memory about what it just did or what it was thinking about. Thinking is a very loose term here. <laughs> so what it, was, what it was just inferencing on, I suppose, is a much better term here. So um, recurrent neural networks are just about everywhere now. They are the dominant model, at least in LLMs. When you're building a model, you or a data scientist will adjust something called a hyperparameter. They're all the parameters within the model that can be adjusted. This is an example right here of a hidden layer within the model. X is the previous um, layer. Y is the next layer. The weights and the biases that you see here, the W's and the B's, those are the things, the math, the numbers that are adjusted during the training run to create value or to create a, a difference as, as inputs are shooting through the model. This is very much like the brain is working or, or a, a typical brain is working. Uh, man, my brain is working overtime right now. I don't know about your guys, but <laughs> this is what it is. Softmax in this particular setting is, um, is an example of a hyperparameter that a data scientist or even truly any of you might set when you're training a model. The, the amount of change on each iteration is called the learning rate. And that brings me to the next section, which is when you build a model and you're using hyperparameters, what you're doing is you're iterating on the data. And your, your, each iteration of the data, you're changing your weights and your biases as you look at the data to build the model. This is called an iteration or an epoch or an epoch. I mean, I think it's epic in, in jolly old England, but I'd like to say epoch, but it's whatever it is. Um, and over each iteration of the model, it looks the system looks at all of the training data and the model is refined based on this loss function that's calculated at the end of the iteration and then back propagated through the model. And as you can see here, uh, we have some math here at the bottom here. The model is deemed um, acceptable when it can appropriately uh, model the, the, the math or best fit these curves or data points. So you see here's a curve, and here's the linear regression, excuse me, that, um, that's, what the, that's what the model's doing. Okay, let's continue onward, because I think we're getting somewhere here, right? We're getting somewhere. Um, the model is refined based on this loss function, which is a measure of error. So um, um, as we do each epoch or epoch, we're gonna feed the model data, that's the training data that's running through the top. We're going to calculate the loss, the loss function, which we're going to back propagate the loss through the model, which is going to modify the weights and the biases ever so slightly or, or a lot. And then we're going to, that's refining the model. And then we're going to feed it more data and do it again and again and again and again and again and again and again until our loss function is acceptable to us and our business based on whatever, you know, whatever loss is acceptable to us. So that's it. That's all this, this thing is. So at the end of the day, when you do all this training, you're left with this. You're left with a network definition of whatever this model is, and you're left with a whole bunch of weights and biases with nothing but magnitudes, numbers and magnitudes, not even any directions on it. And that's it. That's a trained model. That's all we're doing. But realize, folks, that once you train a model, you're not done. That model could be good for for day one, day two, day 10, but it may not work for day 200, day 300. It may become stale and much less useful at that point. But this is in essence what a trained model is or, or really what, what we're trying to go for by doing all this training. When we build these models, we typically don't do this from scratch with a bunch of C code and come up with our own idea of what a model may look like. No, we use deep learning frameworks. So I want to give you some of the examples of deep learning frameworks that are popular in today's world in 2024. Here are four. Honestly, they're more like three. And I'll tell you why in a second. So TensorFlow is a, now let me see if I can remember this all because I just, jumbled in my head. It's not something I think about often, but Temp TensorFlow came from the Google Brain um, project, 
and was released under the Apache 2.0 license somewhere around 2015, 16, 14, something like that. Um, it's, uh, as you can probably imagine, TensorFlow used the Tensor as its main um, data type. Uh, I have a lot of experience with TensorFlow. PyTorch is a is a is a is a Python-based deep learning framework, and it's um, it was it um, debuted from Facebook. That's right, Facebook. I I can't believe I remember that. Yep, Facebook. And um, this is what all of your LLMs are based on. Most of them, although they certainly can be easily refactored into TensorFlow or other deep learning frameworks. But PyTorch is by far and away the most popular one, at least at least for LLMs. And then there's Cafe. I probably have the most experience myself with Cafe uh, doing various things. This is um, a culmination of all the work that came out of the Berkeley Vision Learning Center, if I got that correctly, correct, about a decade ago, and is wildly popular among vision uh, uh, folks that are doing um, AI with vision. Finally, there's Keras. Keras is a sort of a... Um, um, an, an open source neural network library that's written in Python, but it runs on top of other uh, frameworks, most notably TensorFlow. In fact, I think it's, I think it's actually in the TensorFlow default install now, if you want to look at it. Um, so it's not specifically a framework, but as you talk to all these folks at the conference here, they're probably going to be talking to you all about these different frameworks and um, you know they may refer to Keras as sort of its own framework because it's so very popular and powerful. So here are four different frameworks for your consideration, at least so that you know what they are and what they do. Once we build a model, what do we do with it? Up until now, we've been talking about building a model. Building a model is the most basic thing you can do in an AI landscape. After you build the model, what do you do with it? How do you use it? Well, very simply put, we take this model, which is which is made from these deep learning frameworks and has these biases and weights, and we wrap it in an API. It, an API could be anything. You can have an API that accepts vision files or JSON files or whatnot. Well, that will then send that input data into the model the model will then inference on that data, or sometimes known as score, although we don't really use that word as much anymore, scoring. Inference is more the big word that we want to use. And then we have an output that comes out of the model. In this particular case, you can see it says something like, hey, it's a success. Um, uh, here's the file that I, I inferenced on, and here's the confidence value that I assign this model. Excuse me, confidence is like, how, how confident am I that it is, that image is, this label oh, excuse me again oh. uh, so that is um you know that's a typical uh, deployment of an api model so we have to wrap it in code and other um, applications to get derive real value from this model once we create the model the hard part really though is creating the model model wrapping it in traditional programming apis is the easy part and the fun part the quality of results of this model is um, is called the confidence value. So this re re the confidence value is relating only to the prediction. If when I'm talking about accuracy, I'm talking about how accurate the model is, the correct correct per the predictions with this within the test data. This is a big difference. You have to understand when someone's talking to you about confidence, they're talking about inferencing on that model, using the model. When someone's talking to you about accuracy, they're talking about the model itself, not an individual inference of the model, but the accuracy of the model itself based on the test data that they judge accuracy by. And here again is an ex is a is a um, an example that shows that it's about 95% confident that that picture is a cream egg or whatever it happens to be. They have different cream eggs, by the way, in England. Our cream eggs don't look like that. That looks gross, but our cream eggs are pretty great. Am I right? I think I'm right. <laughs> All right. I did a lot of imaging work with my early AI career, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about imaging. Imaging is important. I have a lot of manufacturing imaging experience. 
So the first thing is here, and again, I'm not going to bore you to death here. So the first thing is here is when you want to, it's something called classification. I want to classify what the image is. So the first image right there, that's a cat. Great. That's great that the image is of a cat. But where is the cat in the image? That's localization. So I'm going to describe where in the image the cat is. Typically, I'm going to draw a box around the cat, right? Um, then there's something called object detection, which is even more computationally impressive. Is that when I when I look at um, when I when I'm um, I can look at various uh, objects within the picture and I can pick them out and localize them with again drawing boxes around them. So here you see a couple of cats and a dog and a duck. That's all great and good and all, but the the, the creme de la creme of this particular uh, image recognition technique is called something called image seg or instance segmentation. I'm going to draw an exact box over every single picture that is in, or pixel that is in this picture, and you can see here we have the exact boxes drawn around the cats and the dogs and the ducky, right? So that's something called instance segmentation, and every single one of you has probably seen instance segmentation before. If you haven't, pull out your iPhone. I don't even know where my iPhone is here. Pull out your iPhone, bring up the photo gallery, and double tap on a, a subject in that photo gallery. The AI that's running locally on the device will then do instant segmentation over whatever you're pointing at and pull it out of the picture. Not only that, but then all the background information is gone and you can save it and do whatever you want with it. This is how far we've gone. That particular type of work five, six years ago was just an awful lot of computation, even on the uh, inferencing side of the house. So now at this point, you've all learned a little bit about what a generic or, uh, view of AI is, then machine learning, and then finally deep learning. Now let's talk about working with LLMs. That's the new hotness. That's what this entire conference is about. That's what you see all over the news with uh, ChatGPT and XAI and IBM doing all the things that they're doing. It's, it's pretty amazing what you can do with LLMs. So there's a couple of terms you should be aware of when working with LLMs. First of all, what is an LLM? Well, an LLM, and I like this, this part of a definition, and I, I touched up a little bit, it's partly because from Wikipedia and partly from DJ. So here's what it is. Uh, an LLM is a computational model that is noted for its ability to achieve general purpose language generation and other language processing tasks, such as, and there's many of them, but classification, extraction, text generation, summarization, question and answer, you name it, it can do it. That's what an LLM does. That's what it does. And there are several examples of popular LLMs out there that you've all probably heard of. I've talked about a few of the companies that sponsored the big examples. One is Meta's Llama 2. Another one is OpenAI's GPT-4. Another is XAI's Grok. So that's Elon Musk's um, competition to OpenAI. And of course, I love IBM. IBM's Granite and Slate models are probably some of my favorite because they have a much more transparent training data so you can see what what it has been trained on and that brings me to a really foundational point are you ready for this one <laughs> foundational point about these models is that these are all what i would call or most of them are what i would call foundational models a foundational model is a model that has been pre-trained that i can pick up off the shelf and and use to train my own particular ai application around Meaning I no longer start from zero anymore when I'm doing training. So five, six, seven years ago, if I was doing a train a model, I'd get my data set and I'd start from zero. The model was empty. Nothing was going on in that model. Now I have this idea of using a foundational model that knows a lot about generally uh, what a large language model would be. And I can feed it my own domain knowledge. And this is important. This is the, the whole reason why AI is so exciting and important to folks today. I'm feeding a foundational my, model my domain knowledge, whether it be you know, tax code or, or processor design, which was my heritage back in the day, or um, sales info or Intel or whatnot. 
I'm feeding it that data and I'm going to come out with a particular model that would be good for my use cases that understands the importance, important things that are important to my business. But more importantly, it's something that I don't want to share with anyone else. I don't want Grok to use it or Meta or OpenAI. That's my business benefit of, of, of you know, my data being used for my competitive advantage. That's why I want to use a foundational model. So that's what a foundational model is used for. That's what it is. I no longer start from zero. I want to talk about prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is sort of this new field that you're going to hear all about uh, when you go out there and you talk to more folks, new data scientists in this conference and uh, or any conference you go to really. Prompt engineering is the idea of being able to talk to or or prompt a large language model. There are generally three types of prompt engineering. Zero shot, which is I'm not prompting it. I'm just going to tell it what I want. It better get it and I'm off to the races with my output. One shot prompting, which is I'm going to say, hey, I want to talk about llamas today. All these questions I'm going to say after this prompt are going to be at llamas. Well, that's good. Now it's really um, using the the recurrent um, um, if properties, the memory properties of the model to make sure it understands that everything after this we're doing a bunch of llama llama jokes or or whatever it is that is llama. Okay. And then there's few shot prompting, which is exactly the same thing as one shot, but a couple of prompts. And you're checking along the way that the model understands your prompts, or at least that you think the model understands the prompts. And that's a big deal here. That's, that's a huge differentiation. You know, you, you think the model understands the prompts. You don't really know if the model ever is really understanding your prompts um, because you don't. <laughs> Because it's a model and it's hard and it's a lot of calculations and no one can even explain how it even works. So this is what prompt engineering is. All right. Again, looking at most AI conferences these days, uh, you're going to hear the term generative AI, which is just um, a traditional AI model that is built uh, that can generate new content from whatever input it is given. That's it. It's making new stuff all the time. Um, now I gave you, I think on this, this is a part IBM, part Wikipedia, part Facebook answer of what generative AI is. Um, gener generative, I should say, generative, generative, eh. potato, potato, right? Eh. <laughs> generative AI is, I shouldn't say generative. This is, that's more like ger generic. <laughs> It's, that's not good. I, I amuse myself, clearly. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit what a GPT is, right? You're talking about chat GPT. Well, the G in, in chat GPT is generative, so it's creating new stuff. P is pre-trained, meaning the model has been trained on an enormous pile of data, to taught and which is taught to uh, resolve your problem and give you some specific output. And the T is something called the transformer, which is just a, a deep learning architecture um, that transforms input to another type of output. That's all a transformer is. It takes an input and transforms it, does something to it, and gives an output to it. So that's what uh, a GPT is. So uh, again, transformer, just some type of a model or subtype of model. I would be remiss if I didn't mention this to you during our discussion here. What are GPUs and where do they come into play? NVIDIA is not one of the most valuable companies in the world because it just stumbled and stubbed its foot and then they play a bunch of PlayStation and Xbox games. No, NVIDIA doesn't do that, that's for sure. GPUs are the engine that builds these models. Not so much run them, but build them. If you need to build giant models, you need to do lots of computations. And the most impressive processors out there for doing that are GPUs, graphics processing units, or some might call them a general processing unit, or a parallel, massively parallel processing unit. They take those tensors, and they take those matrices, and they multiply, add, and accumulate all the data all day long to create these models. And that is what a, a GPU really does and why it's really impressive. Now, when you when you buy a GPU or when you acquire a GPU for deep learning and AI, you can literally do just about two things with it, right? On premises, you buy the hardware yourself and you and you run it and you organize it yourself. If you do that, the only thing I can tell you is you better run it 24 seven 
to get the most value out of it. Period. Okay, that's kind of okay. No duh. I suppose I get that. Um, but there's also something called a, a cloud-based AI GPU compute unit, and all the big hyperscalers have them. IBM and AWS and Azure and uh, you know, Oracle Cloud, they all have cloud, you know, server rooms filled with GPU compute that you can rent for however many dollars you want in the cloud. Um, now, there's going to be an eternal debate whether on-premises is cheaper or cloud resources are cheaper. I'll tell you, in my opinion, cloud resources are never cheaper. Are you kidding me? They're in the cloud. These guys want to make money and they're not cheaper. On-prem is always cheaper. But, you know, you have to have a data center and you have to keep it cool. And then you have to have people to run it and look after it. And then, you know, you have to have typically one customer. Uh, the folks who bought the GPUs keep them busy. Eh, so maybe it's not ultimately, ultimately cheaper. At any rate... It's been almost 50 minutes, and if I was on a stage right now, they'd be pulling me off because the next speaker's got to go. You're dangerous now, right? You're dangerous. You understand what AI is. You understand part of AI, but realize this is a journey. You are not an expert just because you saw Uncle DJ's presentation at a conference once. No, this is just the very first step of your journey. AI will change over time. You must learn more about what it's doing and you must change with it. But what I'm most experienced with and what I'm most excited about is what will you design with this knowledge? What will you design with AI? How will you make the world a better place, provide more value for your business and have some fun, possibly some fun. So uh, in this particular AI conference, which I'm doing this, um, this talk for, there is another session called IBM's Watson X for business value or something like that. It's using IBM's Watson X tool chain, which I do believe is the very best tool chain you can use to develop AI models at scale in the cloud or, or on-prem. It's a great tool chain. It does not lock you in. There's nothing proprietary about it. It uses all open source standards. So you can take that model run it anywhere else you want or bring a model into Watson X and run it within Watson X. It's a pretty unique and, um, and valuable um, a tool chain, really. So I'd like for you to all to consider that and check it out. And very, very lastly, IBM Client Engineered sponsored design thinking workshops and minimally viable product builds. So what is this? So on your journey to an AI app, to derive value for your business. It's hard. Like, okay, I understand what DJ said and all these other people at this conference said. How do I get started? I don't know what to do, man. What, what do I do? This seems hard. It's not hard. It's really not hard, especially when I can teach you and IBM will teach you. So what I would recommend first is let's bring some line of business folks together. This is not the C-suite. This is not the CIO. This is a line of business that have a true business problem. It could be any problem. And we will do something called a design thinking workshop. In design thinking or in design thinking, everybody is a designer. From the admins in the group all the way up to the business leaders in the group and directors and GMs and that type of thing. Everyone is a designer. We bring them all together and we clearly understand what the problem statement is in this particular business problem what resolution looks like, what success criteria looks like, and um, you know, w w how to build the, 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 uh, the finished product or the minimally viable product. IBM then comes in with a series of engineers and builds out the product for you and your business. IBM invests in you because if they, they know that if it works, then you will continue investing in the Watson X tool chain and other things uh, to continue with whatever application is spawned by the design thinking workshop. It's a wonderful way of, of building out applications and proving that they work without really having a ton of skin in the game in the sense that you know, you're not spending $150,000 to see if this thing works or not. IBM's helping you figure that out. And, and I think that if you do the design thinking workshop correctly and the MVP build correctly, you could yield an AI model and a technology and a product that would put you in your business ahead of your competition. And that, that what it, what's it's all about. So 
to round out the whole thing today, I want you to feel confident with the vocabulary of deep learning and AI. And here's a bunch of vocabulary, reduction, logic, feature, classification, classification, machine learning, supervise, all this. You should have uh, some good examples or some good understanding of what AI, machine learning, and deep learning can do for you. And I want to see what you all make with this awesome technology. Again, I am DJ Singley. I work for Mapsys. I'd love to talk to you more about this technology and others. Storage, IBM Power, x86, you name it. Any, any technology out there, we typically spend a lot of time uh, looking at and, um, and helping our customers with. Customers big, customers small, and they, they're all important to us. So appreciate the time today. Listen, folks, AI is a journey, and I welcome you to continue your learning on the journey to AI and to see what you folks ultimately build. So thanks again for, for tuning in and listening to me. Um, if this was valuable, I will do many more of these type of sessions. And if it's not, I'll do uh, something else, I suppose, right? <laughs> All right. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.